Um, you know, going back in time, we've seen the video and you've watched it many times. Is it a different feeling when you are living it, not knowing the outcome, as opposed to watching it on a television screen? It's completely different. For one, on watching it on the television, you have the, the knowledge and safety of knowing that nothing's going to hurt you. And uh, what about emotionally watching it as opposed to living it? It's completely different. Now, um, and I and it, I know you've watched it many times, but I'm going to direct some questions to you as to that night uh, on it. Like for example, that night when it happened, uh, uh, lessen uh, the belief that you've been trained to believe that he was armed. No. Why is that? I actually don't even recall paying attention to what he was wearing or anything of that nature, but it certainly didn't lessen the threat at a certain level. And have you been trained that weapons can be secreted without leaving a visible imprint outside of the clothing? Certainly. They make many holsters that do exactly that. What about pockets? Pockets, yes. Now, um, and what about, you've heard talk about it, and I, I don't want to be repetitious, but we've heard talk about the plus one rule. Yes. Uh, what, is, what was your understanding of that rule based on your training that night? The, the rule of thumb is where we have one gun, is highly likely that we're going to find another or more than that. Right. And does also relate to searching? Yes. Okay. And what's that rule, plus one rule, relating to that? It's, it's the same thing. Where you, where you find one weapon, you're highly likely to find another. Right. And is it also training, like, if you find a weapon, don't assume you found the weapon? No, no. Um, it, when searching, when you do find a weapon, you don't just stop and say, oh, okay, we have the weapon, we're done. It's, you need to keep searching until you can, with absolution, say that it's clear. Now, going back in the time, since you knew there had been a weapon in play and people had felt threatened enough to call the police, in your mind, are you believing there are additional weapons? Yes. And uh, on Mr. Shaver? Yes. Now, going back uh, into time, as Mr. Shaver is coming, first we put Sam on your back, did that resemble a draw stroke to you? That motion didn't appear to be a draw stroke to me, no. Right. It, uh, was your concern more of a security check? Yes. Right. But in any event, you made a decision not to discharge your weapon at him. That's correct. In that, in that split second moment, I decided not to fire. And, and you, you had no animosity towards Mr. Shaver? No, sir. No desire to shoot Mr. Shaver? No. No desire to harm Mr. Shaver? No. In fact, what was your desire regarding Mr. Shaver? I simply wanted him to crawl forward, not place his hands behind his back, be taken into custody, and then the justice system could deal with him as necessary. Did you want him to do as Ms. Portillo had done? Exactly. And Ms. Portillo, no physical harm with weapons came to her? No, sir. She followed instructions and was taken into custody without issue. And was that your hope as to Mr. Shaver? Yes. Now, um, when he is out there, what is the position of your weapon? It, when he's out in the hallway, yes, it would be at. She's talking to me. It, it would be at a um, a low ready. And so again, that's down. Correct. So you can see over it. Right. Did you have any trouble with? A five and a half foot hallway of visualizing the whole hallway? No, sir. I, I could see everything in front of me. I could see the entire field of view. And uh, now, do you have to wear glasses? No, I don't. Uh, do they help you? They, they actually just make the picture more crisp for me. All right. And do you, did you wear them that night? I did. And they were the prescriptions that make your vision better? Yes. So you're having no trouble visualizing the whole width of the highway, hallway? No, no, no. To the end? That's correct. Now, um, 
So as Mr. Shaver uh, is calling to you, I'm going to show you what's been admitted as exhibit as Exhibit 231. And uh, this has been uh, identified as the pre-trigger sequence, so before he was shot. And you see on the top thing when Mr. Shaver's on his hands and knees? Yes. And where's your finger? Uh, high on the slide. And is the uh, gun uh, safety still on? Yes. Now I'll show you, and this is about six seconds before the discharge of the weapon. I'll show you the second one, which is about five and a half seconds, no, five seconds before the discharge of the weapon. Uh, where is your finger at that point as he is crawling? It's uh, still in the same position, high on the slide. All right. And again, the safety's on. Yes, sir. As you've been trained. As I've been trained. And I notice uh, that it looks like the, uh, the weapon slides a little bit uh, uh, shifting to the right. Am I correct? Yes, sir. And what was that? So, like approximately three-tenths of a second. My intent in that moment, because keep in mind, I still had two issues that I had to deal with. I had, had my immediate concern, Mr. Shaver, to my left, and then to my right, I still had the doorway, the unknown. We, we didn't know if someone was in that room. We didn't know if they had the weapon or, or whatnot. But those are the two areas of concern that I had to focus on. And so I was, my intent was to place my rifle in the middle ground um, between two levels of concern. And now he's roughly 10 feet away in a five and a half, half foot hallway. Correct. When you're moving your weapon looks like slightly to the right. Yes. Did you lose sight of Mr. Shaver? No, sir. Did you not see him 10 feet away in a five and a half foot hallway? I saw him very clearly. I shifted maybe a few degrees off of Mr. Shaver. And, uh, and then we've learned and at this point, your finger is not inside the trigger guard, and this is about one second before uh, the shooting. Correct. The safety's still on. Safety's still on. No intent to shoot Mr. Shaver. No, sir. And goal again? Goal again is simply for him to crawl towards us, be taken into custody, unharmed, and we have proceeded as from there. Now I'm going to show you what's in evidence as Exhibit 221. And the top photo uh, is roughly three seconds and uh, about three seconds before the actual shooting. Yes. You see Mr. Shaver's position? Yes. You see your position of the weapon? I do. What position is the, is the weapon in? It's, it's still in a low ready. It's more, it's, it's a little bit higher up. I can still see over the scope so that I have more of a, a picture of what's going on between Mr. Shaver and the unknown doorway. Okay. And then we see uh, a still. Oh, let me ask you this. We're showing you stills yes. uh, that are about approximately one thirtieth of a second. Right. When you're visualizing this, are you seeing stills? No, sir. What are you seeing? I'm seeing everything in real time. This, right. this surpassed in a few moments. Okay. In one thirtieth of a second. Correct. Uh, now, we see in the second one of Exhibit 221... Uh, and this is taken about two-thirds of a second before the gun's discharged. And I notice um, Mr. Shaver's, you see his right shoulder going up? Yes, sir. And his left shoulder going down? Yes. 
And then we see your response in this split second of time. Uh, what's happening then? This is the moment where I begin to perceive the threat. The motion of the arm sliding back and the minute it disappears out of my view and the elbow begins to raise, that's the moment when I decide to fire. All right. And how do you know that? Based on my training and the totality of the circumstances, the reason why I'm there in the first place. I'm there for a man with a gun. I haven't located a gun. And this is a man. So I, I have to presume he's armed based on my training. And then making that motion, which appeared to me as a, as a classic draw stroke, the motion, if I may stand, yeah. moving directly to the side, it looked exactly like someone was drawing a pistol or some type of weapon. And that's how I perceived it in that moment. And, and again, are you seeing still photos or is it a pattern of movement? It's a pattern of movement. And I notice at this moment in time, your index figure begins to enter the trigger guard. Yes, sir. And what does that tell you? That I'm in the process of making the decision to fire. Uh, is the decision made before your finger goes, you know, when your finger enters the trigger guard? The decision to fire wasn't made until the hand was completely out of view and the elbow was raised. All right. And uh, so about two-thirds of a second before you fired, you've now entered the trigger guard. Yes. Now, this is taken, according to testimony, about a half second, actually 0.474 seconds, so 47 hundredths of a second before the gun is discharged. You see Mr. Shaver's elbow? Yes, I do. You see his head? Yes, I do. Now, uh, was the fact that his head is not facing you lessen any threat? No, sir. And actually, based on my training, when we go through the academy and firearms training, it's drilled into our heads, stop looking at your holster when drawing your weapon, because the common thing for an untrained individual to do is to look towards the area of the weapon that they're going to be reaching for. Now, is all this being analyzed in your brain in this one second? It was very fast. Yeah, look at your, look where your finger is at that moment in time, direct proximity to the trigger. Yes, sir. What does that tell you when your finger when his elbow is there and your finger's in direct proximity to the trigger. The decision to fire has been made, and at that point I'm proceeding to fire my weapon. Okay. And uh, so at that point, a half second before the weapon's fired, the brain has sent the decision to the hand, and the hand is implementing it. Correct. So what's happening in that moment is I'm flipping the safety off, my fingers in, getting ready to pull the trigger, I'm bringing my rifle up to my right eye, closing my left eye so that I can have a clearer picture through my right eye as I'm looking through the aim point, the scope of the rifle. Now let's talk about that. Uh, did you close your left eye prior to the decision being made to shoot? No. I close the eye when the decision to shoot is made. When you're in fact actually shooting. When I'm in fact firing the weapon. Now we've broken this down frame by frame, hundreds of a second. In reality, it, it happens. It almost in an instant. I believe I described it in my interview as in the blink of an eye. Well, we know it happened in one second. Yes. And, uh, but prior to that one second, did you, were you looking through the scope and closing your eye? No. And had Mr. Shaver not made 
the motion that uh, you recognized as identical to a draw stroke under the circumstances of this case, would you have discharged your weapon? No, sir. And did you make the decision to discharge your weapon before his hand comes forward? Correct. And what's, why was that? I, I'm trained that I can't wait to see, in, in a situation like this, where it is a gun call, it is a highly, it is an emergency situation, this level of threat, we, we are trained that we cannot wait until the gun comes into view. For one, I can't see what's coming from the hand coming forward because it's a blur, it's happening so fast. And so in order to actually see the gun, I would have to wait until the hand is stopped. And at that point, several shots could have been fired. And due to the proximity of Mr. Shaver to us, and being in such a tight hallway with no cover, he could have very easily fired and hit any one of us. Now, in that hallway, this five and a half foot wide highway, hallway, how many law enforcement officers are there? Six of us total, and then we had just detained Ms. Portillo, so she would have been the seventh person. So you had seven people in front of Mr. Shaver. Yes. And had you waited until you see a weapon, uh, you've been trained it would it could get one or two or three shots off before you could fire. Exactly. And at that point, I'm responsible for seven other lives. And who are ten feet away. Yes. With no cover. Correct. Now, it appears here that the, at least the decision to fire uh, was being implemented about at this last frame here for uh, 0.47 hundredths of a second. Yes. And that's because your finger was essentially on the trigger. Yes, sir. Did you lose sight of Mr. Shaver at any time in this hallway? No, sir. Now, at the moment you were actually firing the gun, what was your vision of Mr. Shaver? It would have been through my aim point. Right. Which is the a circle? The circle. Show the jury with your hands how the weapon was when you uh, discharged the weapon. It, it would have been, the, the butt of the rifle would have been on my shoulder. My hand would have been on, you know, on the rail where the trigger is left hand up on the barrel, and my eye, my cheek would have been resting against the butt stock of the rifle so that I could peer through the, the side of the aim point. And that only happened after the decision to fire is made? Yes, sir. Now, at the moment when the decision, the decision to fire is made, did you believe that there was an imminent threat of serious injury or death to yourself and others. Absolutely. I, I thought he was reaching for a gun, and I thought someone was going to get shot. Would you have fired your weapon if you did not believe that to be the case? No, sir. Uh, did you also, at the moment the decision to shoot was made, uh, as indicated in that, in that frame, uh, believe that you were going to be taking Mr. Shaver into custody uh, and turned over to detectives for the firearms incident at the window. My hope was that no lethal force was going to be necessary, that Mr. Shaver wouldn't reach behind his back, and that he would be taken into custody, and detectives would pursue the investigation at that point. Was it your belief at the moment that you made the decision to fire the weapon? Uh, at Mr. Shaver, uh, that it was uh, immediately necessary to protect against his use or attempted use uh, of bringing a weapon out. Yes, sir. I, I had a split second, and in that moment when I saw that motion, I had to make a decision right then and there. No, no slow motion videos? No, sir. And did you have a belief at the time you fired the weapon that your action was necessary to uh, 
prevent the commission of the potential aggravated assault with was, a weapon. It was absolutely necessary in that moment. And did you, at that moment, the decisions made, believe that Mr. Uh, that Mr. Shaver posed an immediate threat of serious injury or death to yourself and others? I wouldn't have fired my weapon if I didn't think so. And do you believe that the discharge of your weapon under those totality of circumstances against Mr. Shaver that evening was consistent with your training that you received at the Mesa Police Academy? I followed my training exactly how I was trained, and I believe that. By Officer and Training Instructor Jacobs? Yes. Now, when you fired your weapon, how many times did you fire? I fired until I determined that there was no longer a threat. And how do you determine that? It's, there's, there's several ways you can determine that, but for me it was when I saw Mr. Shaver fall over, I saw that there was no longer a threat. It turns out now that we know you fired for about eight-tenths of a second. Yes. And five times. Yes. Uh, were they quick shots? They were extremely fast. All right. And did you stop firing when you perceived that the threat was over? Immediately. What, what's your, what was your feelings at that point? I was in shock. I couldn't believe that that happened, that I had just been in a shooting. It was scary. Did you fear for your own safety during this shooting? I was terrified and I was scared for everyone else. Did you overreact? No, sir. Did you feel like you overreacted? No, I did not. Now, later, you know it was determined that he uh, did not, in fact, have a weapon. That's correct. When did you find that out? Uh, the next day, after the investigation, after the interview. So when the interview occurred, you, did, uh, you did, had not been told that he'd been unarmed? No. I guess he hadn't been searched at that point. No, he hadn't been searched at that point. Uh, when did you find out that he had consumed <laughs> copious amounts of alcohol? Uh, quite some time after. I, it wouldn't have been a, until after the autopsy report had returned. Uh, did you have indication in your mind that he uh, had, was intoxicated that night? That didn't even cross my mind. What about the claim now that he's was actually reaching for his shorts. Did that go through your mind at those moments? No, sir. Were you paying attention to shorts or? No. What were you paying attention to? My focus was on Mr. Shaver's hands. And had Mr. Shaver been advised not to put his hands out of sight for any reason seconds before it, the shooting occurred? Yes, sir. And did you hear those instructions? I did. Now, uh, there was an exchange between Officer Langley after he did it where Mr. Shaver was warned at least twice not to do this or he'd be shot. And he then followed that up by saying, don't shoot me. Yes. Uh, and then Officer Langley gave the warning again to him. And then for unknown reasons, he chose to do what we've seen on, on the video. That's correct. Um, did you notice, I'm talking about that night, uh, that exchange, or what, what, did, what were you taking away in the moment of that exchange, or were you, if anything? In the moment, I, I didn't really perceive the dialogue, uh, the dialogue between the two. My, my main focus was on Mr. Shaver's actions and his hands. Did you know that he had been warned what not to do with his hands? I, I didn't know that what he had been warned. Did you notice that, uh, uh, that in response to the warning, he said, don't shoot me? Yes. Do you remember hearing it that night? I, I didn't remember hearing it that night, but upon reviewing the video hundreds of times, I, I've been able to guess that. That's and what about uh, that he was upset uh, and, and apparently crying in those seconds before the discharge of the weapon? Did that enter your mind that night as you were on lethal coverage and that 
few seconds? No, that, that didn't enter my mind, and we're trained that we're not necessarily to pay attention to what a suspect is saying, and we're supposed to watch their actions and what they do with their hands. And, uh, as they say, actions speak louder than words? Exactly. Now, after this, after this occurs, uh, is, what happens? After which moment, sir? The, dis the discharge of the weapon. After the discharge of the weapon, I, I remember being in what I felt to be some form of shock. Um, Why do you, what do you, what do you mean by that? Uh, it was more of being involved in such a, a stressful situation as that. I, I didn't expect it to happen. I didn't want it to happen. Um, but it did. And so in that moment, immediately after I had discharged my weapon, I, I had begun my controlled breathing techniques again in order to bring my heart rate down again. And then what occurred? From there, we proceeded to uh, the next uh, threat area, which was room 502, because we, we, we still had a job to do at that point. As you I was uncertain who, if anyone, was in the room? Correct. And then what happened? Um, from there, Sergeant Langley told me to secure my weapon and to head downstairs. And did you do that? I did. What are you feeling at that point? Um, still in disbelief and shock. I couldn't believe what had happened. It just happened. Uh, what happened after that? I went down. Outside, I um, then waited for um, Sergeant Lean, uh, Sergeant Lean, to come pick me up, and he drove me to the um, substation. And was your then eventually your weapon turned in? Yes. Uh, did that evening you uh, uh, agree to do what's been called as a walkthrough? I did. Uh, Prior to, once this happened, did you have any conversations with any of the other officers who had witnessed this or been on the scene? Uh, no, sir. That's why Sergeant Lean uh, came and picked me up. It's essentially a quarantine or to that effect. From the other officers? From the other, uh, other officers there, yes. And, uh, and then did, uh, at some point, did Detective Sight show up and conduct an interview that was read to the jury? Uh, correct. I was brought back to the La Quinta where Detective Sype was. How were you feeling at that moment? Still as I was before, I had just barely been involved in a shooting where I shot someone. What were you mentally like then? I was still in shock, but I tried to compose myself as calm and collected in order to give as best focus as I can to detective site during the interview. And did you? I did the best I could. Yeah. Uh, did you have an opportunity to look at the video before the interview with detective site? I, I had the opportunity to uh, review my video on a small cell phone. Um, the video was very choppy. Uh, and then you sat down for the interview? Um, no, at that point we would have begun the walkthrough, so we would have walked through the scene as I was interviewed. Uh, and you showed them, to the best of your memory, what occurred? Yes. And this is a few hours after the incident? Yes, sir. Uh, the, the recording indicates 2.21 in the morning. Yes. Uh, on it. The, uh, at that point, did the union provide you a lawyer to talk to? They did. Standard practice in an officer-involved shooting? Yeah, that's completely normal practice. Not, a, not necessarily uh, me or a no, no. lawyer that does these things. Right. Um, and who was present uh, to question you? Uh, Detective Sype, as well as several other detectives. And uh, was there a representative of the prosecutor's office there? Yes. And did they ask you a wide variety of questions? They did. Uh, any, uh, any limitation on their questions? No. Uh, you, 
you decided, although you had the right not to answer questions, to sit down and answer any questions they asked. Right. And did they control the questions in terms of what information they were soliciting and you provided the answers? That, that's how it went, yes. And they all asked all the questions they had at that moment? At that moment, yes. Was there any follow-up interview of you uh, by detective site with additional questions the next day or two days or three days later? No, after after this interview, that was, that was it, and I, was, I wasn't contacted again after that. Okay. Did you go home that evening? I did. What time did you go home? I think it wasn't until around 4 in the morning, 5 in the morning. Uh, what, are you, what are you feeling at that point? Uh, nothing's changed at that point. I'm still in disbelief, shock of what had happened. Did you sleep? No, I didn't. I didn't sleep for the first 72 hours. What were your thoughts? Uh, regarding what occurred to Mr. Shaver? I, I felt incredibly sad for him. I, I assumed that he had a family. And then uh, upon receiving the knowledge that he was unarmed, it just brought things into a, a further disbelief and understanding. I, I, I still can understand why he would make that motion. Wish this had never occurred? Absolutely. That's all I have, Your Honor. Mr. Gross, would you say you still can or can't? I, I still can, cannot understand why he made that motion. Of course.